Hello, everybody, and welcome to On Air's fifth episode. Today, we're getting a tour of Nicholas Kahn's studio from Kahn and Selesnik, our artists in residence, and we'll be hearing more about their project that they're working on while in residence with us and get to see what Nicholas sees every day. Um, a good way to hear more about the, uh, our programs and what else we have coming up is by following us on social media. Uh, Victor will be sharing those links in the chat. And before we dive in, I want to remind you that we are uh, wanting to support our local businesses and local community <coughs> businesses, sorry. Um, so today we're supporting Elizabethan Desserts in Encinitas. They're offering cookies, cupcakes, bread, sweet and savory pies and casseroles, all for curbside pickup. So, uh, and even if you're inspired today from the tour, sorry, I'm out of breath today. <laughs> Welcome to Saturday. <laughs> so if you are inspired today um, by the tour that you get and you wanna create something yourself, they're also offering a variety of flowers and yeast to create your own edible art. So now I'm going to uh, pass it over to Nicholas, but if you do have any questions at any point, leave them in the Q&A section and at the end, we can ask all of the questions. Um, just nothing inappropriate, but <laughs> all right, Nicholas. Take it away. Hello. Um, so, welcome to Ghent, New York. Um, this is my studio that I only have been in maybe two weeks, three weeks. It's the former room in the house that we had a pet rabbit living in, and it was basically sort of a pigsty, but a rabbit version. There was hay on the ground and rabbit poo everywhere. But come quarantine, I couldn't go into the studio I have in Hudson, New York, which is 10 minutes away. So um, I started renovating this first thing when the first week that I was stuck back at home every day and painted everything white. It was a former kitchen renovation of a, of a sun porch. So it's a small but really nice place now that I've got it together to work on stuff. Um, and I'll show roughly what it looks like first this way um small room but i think i can switch it around and let's see switch cameras so i look out the window there's a little porch and there's a marsh where there's a beaver lodge out in the middle there, and all sorts of animals that we watch all day long. The desk where I'm doing working in the sketchbooks is a painting that Richard did of me, maybe 95, in the style which we paint. So with these marshes, these are the flowers that I'm growing in the garden outside. So I'm able to garden a lot more now that I'm stuck at home. Um, this is the first big pastel that I've done since I'm here. Um, it's a flag and we're doing a project that involves these flags and Richard's going to help me describe that. And so this, they're two-sided drawings in pastel and colored pencil. I'll bring in the other one at some point and show. And this is like half bumblebee, half roots. He's like flying and rooting. He's like a plant and an animal covered in pollen at the same time. And there's pastels. Uh, not a normal, there's Richard, he's a coffer. Um, <laughs> uh, and so the, the, they are very kindly provided me with some of these pastels, uh, some really good soft ones from the Lux uh, uh, as we started the residency, I had pre-ordered a lot of things thinking I was going to be going to Encinitas, California and having this beautiful space and have my work in the show there, which we do have. Um, but uh, something strange happened with a virus. I don't remember what it's actually called, but maybe it's a pandemic. Um, and so I couldn't go to California and we didn't know until like a few weeks before it was all happening. This being a rabbit room and I'm rabbit obsessed, seems to go very well with Easter. There's even the Paschal lamb back there. So, and then for the 
Trooper played a mouse. We have a lot of bats in our story. So there's one of my sculpted bats and in a fireplace I made years ago. There's the library is the next room in there. And then obsessively, since I got here, I need to be able to find where all the colored pencils are. So all the whites, the reds, the blues, they're all organized together. And all the other tools by nature because I'm a mess normally. So this is really helping me get organized. And some of the most important books for what I'm looking at right now uh, to do these drawings are in here. The, the next room is filled with books, some tarot decks, R deck, cutting devices, another earlier painting. Um, so I'm pretty organized for me. Let me switch it around. Richard, why don't you speak while I turn this ring? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, why don't you put up the flag of the dragonfly? I will do that. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, you speak and I'll go get that. Yeah, the, the plan with these flags is to uh, eventually uh, get enough of them, I would say, we, you know, we can start photographing them, maybe when we've got uh, six or, or seven of them done. Um, obviously, we're going to have to wait till the uh, uh, quarantine's over uh, to actually get out and photograph them. Uh, but the idea was to um, to make outfits that would be kind of uh, black veils um, put over a uh, character who's wearing kind of slightly formal black clothes, um, carrying these flags, almost doing uh, like a funerary kind of procession. Um, uh, that would be sort of about uh, the decline in uh, insect uh, that's going on at the moment. Um, like if you're as old as we are, you probably remember growing up and uh, uh, driving somewhere in the, in the car. And uh, literally, by the time you got to your destination in the summer, the entire car would be covered in squashed insects. And uh, these days, uh, if you take a drive in the summer, you won't find any squashed insects on your car. So that's just like an anecdotal kind of thing that pretty much everyone our age has noticed. Uh, yeah, I remember in uh, my first trip to Holland in 1976, driving uh, from Amsterdam out into the countryside, and that's where I've never seen more bugs covering our windscreen. And I also remember the walls of the, the canal house covered in blood from killing all the mosquitoes in Amsterdam. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and uh, growing up in Baton Rouge, obviously, we had huge, huge amounts of insects uh, in the summer. Uh, but these days, yeah, yeah, the insect population is clearly not what it once was. And uh, that has all kind of, uh, kinds of implications to do with uh, pollination um, and also because insects are on the bottom of the food chain. Uh, that affects all kinds of uh, other animals. Uh, frogs and small mammals. So it's kind of a run on effect of uh, having less insects. Uh, so we wanted to make almost like this uh, funeral march uh, with all our characters carrying flags of the insects. Yeah, and we're thinking of using a little bit of the, the flagpole techniques that you see in uh, like Kurosawa films like Ram, uh, where there's bamboo poles and then a top pole that goes on, on that. The sort of Samurai style flags. Yeah, in my back garden here, I have a huge bang, bamboo grove. Uh, so yeah, we're going to cut a bunch of bamboo, uh, make poles for the flags, um, and we. Uh, the original plan was that um, Nicholas was going to go get some was going to get some of these flags going out at the residency, and then I was going to join him for the second half, and we were going to go out and start photographing them. Um, but obviously now the plan's changed, um, so uh, we'll see what we end up doing. Okay, I'm going to switch the camera around and show the second. Well, this is actually the first flag I did while uh, I was starting the residency, and it's not as sharp as this funny one, but there I'll go in close. So it's the classic dragonfly in insane detail. And so this one's a lot more colored pencil work because it's really fine detail. Um, and then the highlights in the pastel, the white pastel, and a little bit of um, chartreuse pastel. Uh, it's brighter uh, for the highlights on the caterpillars. The dragon 
headed caterpillars. They're Chinese caterpillars. They turn into a stranger butterfly, but the, drag, the dragon head intrigued me. Um, it's a little like uh, the Ouroboros, the snake that eats its tail, but it's two, one following the other uh, in this endless cycle. And there was something about, he's an American dragonfly here. Um, and he's standing in the middle and the Chinese are circling around his base. Uh, it felt right. I cannot tell you how and why, but they're both dragons, the dragonfly and the dragon-headed things. Oh, uh, part of the whole uh, rewilding thing we're thinking about is that if, uh, basically, if people start interfering with nature less at this point, you'll get sort of a war going on between native and invasive species. Um, and that, that'll have effects on, on plants and up and down the food. That's kind of an interesting issue that people are thinking about at the moment. Um, I'm trying to turn the flag over, so. Uh, uh, yeah, part of the reason we were thinking of, uh, of the veils for the characters uh, holding the flags, it, it was a number of things. Um, we're thinking that first of all, it's kind of mournful, but secondly, I certainly remember at times, uh, you know, gardening 20 years ago, I would literally need to wear uh, um, a kind of veil to stop the insect. Um, so it felt like an appropriate thing to wear in a kind of like a funerary insect parade. Okay, so here's uh, the back of the, um, dragonfly one, and it says, hmm, what does that say? Dragon on the top, if you read it backwards, and then Aegis. Oh, yes. Aegis is up at, at the place of, I think, or from the place, and then it says in the middle, metamorphose, metamorphose, because those caterpillars are metamorphosizing. Oh, the, the um, caterpillars on the front, so. Yeah, um, and then it also says in letters going around the wreath, it starts on the upper right, Osiris Ra, um, because he is a god of regrowth in Egypt, like the same thing, uh, he's sort of a green man -y, god of the Egyptians and uh, for all about rewilding and bringing back the growth and from the center of this wreath of, of uh, sort of laurel leaf, it goes up to a stem of a poppy. Uh, oh. so, so that's and what, what is. What is Nogard? It's, uh, Nogard is dragon backwards. Because uh. then on the reverse, um, you will see, um, let me turn this around again, on the reverse, it's in reverse letters, but reads dragon, but backwards letters. Yeah, coming through on the front side, you see it in the correct uh, order. Yes, exactly. Uh, and I'm going to go to the back side of the other flag now, so you can chat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the idea is that when we uh, photograph these things uh, and the sun comes through the uh, fabric, uh, that you'll get, get kind of uh, ghostly images of uh, whatever is on the other side of the flag. Uh, we're planning to, um, uh, at least for these, do the, the as a panorama, uh, so that you'll get a bunch of uh, processioners, all probably appropriately six feet apart, uh, walking with the flags. Okay, almost there. A little bit of a dance in the studio. Is it's not that much wall space? Okay, um, and now I will flip this around again, or I can show it this way. Uh, there we go. So that is a head that's like a hive head of pollen or honey um, or the, the pollen-y stuff seems to be coming out of his mouth, he's breathing it, and it goes around him, and it's sort of, it's the, the mind of the bee, sort of That's transmuted bee. into human. Yeah, it's also, it's kind of like, it feels like it's also about like a, 
allergies, the way these things can be. Uh, they, they can walk a fine line between being uh, toxic to us and really helpful to us. And I was also trying to visualize the stuff that we can't see right now, this strange virus that we're accidentally breathing in or breathing out to people, but a positive version of that in a strange way. So it's about the kind of particles that are sort of all around you that you're not seeing. So it could be pollen, it could be virus. Yeah, here very glorious. We're kind of thinking much more about what we're breathing in and all the things that are in the air uh, that we don't tend to think of that much. So yeah, there we go. Bouchard, back to you. Tell us some, some questions. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, guys. Actually, um, a really interesting part, when I first saw the back of the dragonfly, uh, I'll turn my camera on as well. Um, when I first look at, looked at the back of the dragonfly and I saw a Nogard, I actually looked it up because I was curious what it meant. And I found out that it's a character on World of Warcraft, which I know nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because, you know, you're developing a world of your own as well. This really elaborate history with all these backstories and all these characters have names, you know, and like you have uh, the Book of Faith, uh, uh, Lulu, uh, Lulu's Book of Faith, right? And you have all these characters. So I thought it was interesting how, you know, these names are connecting to other worlds as well. well it's interesting because um, oftentimes uh, bits of uh, nonsense will, will become kind of uh, things we can use in the project. Uh, so that's like, a, you know, that's a gambit we often use anyway. Yeah, not, uh, sorry, <laughs> yeah. I love that. Um, so, you know, I think we would all like to know a little bit more about how you guys met. How did you start your collaborative work? Um, give us your history. Yeah, we we met in college. We went, uh, we we're both finalists for a scholarship um, at Washington University in St. Louis. And the university, all the finalists uh, out, out there, um, you know, to, to decide who the actual winner was. And, yeah, so we were seniors in high school at that point, um, and we were 17, and we had this conversation. They had, they had put us together in, the, in like staying in some freshman's room or something like that, and Richard grew up half in England, half in America. My mother was English, and I would spend my summers in England, and so we both ended up really loving the same artists and writers, and we were comparing who we were interested in, and it was thought, oh, this guy's cool. I hope we go both end up the same going here and uh, maybe we'll be friends because he's interested in all these different media and he kind of seems to like the same things. Yeah, I think uh, one thing that's uh, I think key with a lot of uh, collaborative artist teams is uh, meeting while you're young, while you're still actually in the developmental uh, stage. I think it'd be hard to kind of start collaborating if you were in your 50s. Yeah, and uh, we, we both noticed that when, when you, we actually agree on liking people like William Blake and, and Samuel Palmer and, and Stanley Spencer and all this group of early English artists. Um, so we have the same goals with the art that's talking around, about a sort of type of romanticism and then a lot of contemporary artists, we almost always seem to like the same ones. So we're after the same thing so usually our arguments are about how to get there but not so much the final goal being one thing or another so they're not to to the death arguments that might be if you're coming from a different background because our projects tend to have a lot of different aspects of them we also have um uh, plenty of autonomy on with working on stuff uh, so you know it's not a case of you're just working on things and anyone's looking over your shoulder yeah, Richard's usually 35 minutes distant away in all the various places we've lived over the years, and that seems the ideal distance to be for collaboration for somehow. <laughs> so this really flowed very naturally. That's really uh, amazing. Uh, Richard, you touched a little bit upon this as well, but uh, maybe you guys can collaborate a little bit, or col collaborate? Uh, elaborate English. <laughs> 
<laughs> elaborate a little bit more uh, about the different roles that you both take in developing your work. Um, is it very much where you work on every aspect together or it's you take on this, you take on, well, elaborate please. Yeah, I think what, what tends to happen is that uh, in the uh, brainstorming part of the project, um, we'll back and forth a lot and kind of, um, we'll work out the general parameters and rule system of the project. And then within that, um, you know, someone might want to go work on, um, you know, like Nicholas is doing, uh, work on uh, uh, painting flags or whatever it is. Um, someone might want to work on a video aspect uh, for an installation. Someone might want to work on text for a book, um, photographs. So in other words, there's a lot of different media that if either of us are feeling like drawn to work within that certain media, there's uh, plenty of scope to do so. Yeah, in the in the most recent project, uh, this, the, the Book of Fate, which involves a lot of circular photographs, circuit, large circular drawings and ceramics uh, pieces. I work pretty much exclusively on ceramics because I, it's just a medium that I'm particularly fluid on and Richard did a bit more of the photoshoppery on the pictures that we shot together largely. Um, but I worked on plenty of them uh, as well in, in that degree. Uh, I made a lot of the more of the cloth costumes. Richard did some paper costumes he constructed. That's just more of his natural skill is, is in that direction. He doesn't sew. Um, and they're all together right now. There's a show at Robichon Gallery in Denver. And if you go online to robichongallery.com or uh, you'll find a really nice video of that show. And that just opened a couple of days ago and that'll be up for the uh, virtual show. Interesting for your viewers to check out that video because it's, um, I'd say it's almost like the uh, the twin exhibition to the one that's at Lux currently. Yes, um, we're actually, uh, I'm talking to Jennifer from Robichon Gallery about uh, maybe showing the video on one of our on-air episodes uh, and uh, she'll be part of our curatorial panel discussion on one of the on-air episodes as well. So, perfect. Uh, yeah, Robichon yeah. will be uh, part of this as well and the exhibition that you guys have there, which is uh, really beautiful. Um, so I have a couple questions coming in as well. Um, yeah. I think uh, this is how much time on average do you spend ahead of time preparing your ideas and projects, whether for a residency or an exhibition, uh, and how much of that is spent together versus separately? Okay, yeah, that, that, can, that, that can really vary, depend, like sometimes it'll feel like we're, um, you know, we might even be, because we're kind of working on stuff concurrently, uh, when, we're, when we start uh, talking about doing a project, we're often finishing the previous one. So we can end up uh, discussing uh, the next project for as long as uh, six months. It really uh, depends. Yeah, it feels like the, the, the one that we're starting now with the flags, Rich and I were brainstorming for about six months and then it was getting a little crunch time knowing that I was going to be going out to Lux in California and visualizing what I could possibly do there. So I was actually thinking about using some of the ceramics facilities there, even though I have some here locally, not nearly as good. So some of the, the ideas centered around some, some sculptural things that we can't quite work on now, but um, as it got closer and closer to going out and not knowing if we could go out or not, I worked out pretty much how I might be able to do these flags. And I started preparing those and drawings for those and the ideas got sharper and the rule systems that Richard and I discussed back and forth every week, I would try and interrupt all the other stuff we were preparing for with shows with little drawings and discussions we'd have on how the physical flags might look, what, what would be the motifs, what, what can we depict in this one, how it would fit with our other series, would there be a book coming out of it, what are the color constraints? What what would the photos look like? We were deciding whether they might be panoramic photos. Well, just to, yeah, just to give um, give the uh, viewers an idea, we're also as we're actually working on the project, we're actually figuring out uh, what it's about while we're doing it. So I'd say the show that's up at Lux at the moment 
I felt like we were working on it two or three years before I even really got a grip on really what it was about. No, yeah, it's, 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 it's a hard part too. We It's like two or three years after we've done a lot of work on a project that we're trying to really fit it together, cut out bits that weren't really right, join the, the disparate parts, find the best media to present it. So it's that's about a five year project or more in that Lux has in uh, from the very beginning to really the final presentation in the book that we did, which it might've worked a year on the writing of the book. So it's a, it's a long thing. So we're just at the start of our third section. Yeah. Of this work. We have several ideas for like, you know, a photograph will do with the flags, but in, in terms of what the, overall scheme of the project ends up being, that's uh, gonna be uh, worked out over the coming years, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's amazing uh, that you as the artists uh, yourselves are maybe a not completely aware of the lives that Trub Fledermaus lives themselves. Like you're also kind of an outsider to this carnival troupe that you're discovering more of as you get to think more documentation. I think that's true. I think it makes it more interesting for us also. Like I remember reading a thing, there's two different ways that authors tend to write books. Some plan out the entire thing first, others uh, very much uh, just go into it not knowing what's going to happen and want to discover it as they go along. Uh, so I would say, yeah, we've definitely done both approaches. Yeah, it's it's sometimes harder on the ones where we don't know all the the plot line ahead of time. We're looking for clues. Uh, sometimes some of it comes when we're laying on our couches or laying at night in dreams or some. It's 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 really interesting why we might do something maybe for a completely different reason than we thought initially, and then the other one in the partnership will see the connection and and then link to disparate ideas and with another piece or a bit of writing. And it's revealed to us that this there was some really odd kind of connections, and we're now discovering all these odd things in uh, the the various Blader Mouse projects that sort of predicted this sort of pandemic and where we're at now, and that maybe we were accessing some other kinds of clues in the world. Uh, all our bat obsession and pangolin obsession. Uh, and they're the kind of primary animals in in the show that's up at Lux. One of the starting themes of it was the um, extinction of bats because of the white nose fungus, um, which is kind of actually a, a disease that started near where we live in the Hudson Valley uh, among the bat populations here. And so we were kind of reading about that. That was kind of the genesis of the previous project. And so that kind of pandemic amongst the bats in the project, we kind of imagined uh, imagined it spreading to humans and imagined a kind of, uh, you know, slightly post-apocalyptic world that's in a lot of the pictures and the, and the text and in the, in the book uh, that goes with the project. I mean, that's such a powerful concept, right? We, in our minds, don't necessarily really understand what an apocalypse means because our world goes through apocalypses every day. Like we have species whose world completely changes every single day, like the bats, like the insects that you're mm. talking about. And, you know, part of what this at the end of the world uh, is representing is that for a lot of species all across our planet, they are experiencing the end of the world every single day. And, no, I, no. Think, yeah. I think that's true. I think also uh, both me and Nicholas's father and my grandfather were in uh, World War II and that was an unbelievable uh, apocalypse. Um, and, you know, th throughout history, there have been events like this that, uh, you know, that, that maybe the, um, me and Nicholas's generation haven't really experienced uh, firsthand other than hearing things from our relatives or reading about things. Yeah, that, that's, that's that very much it. And having also an empathy for this strange and ugly thing, the scary insects and scary bats is part of what it is. It's, it, it kind of also does connect to me growing up, trying to have empathy for Germans uh, living 
in a world where they're run by their, their, their world that formerly was a great liberal democracy in Germany in the 20s, suddenly it's got this fascist spirit going through it because there's been a collapse. And our work's been a lot about that. And then suddenly all that empathy, I was trying to understand the Germans who pers persecuted my grandparents and my father was in, in World War II as a cameraman. And then now our own world, we have this German named man who's doing some incredibly similar things to our own country. And it's scary as anything on both levels, the, the, the kind of uh, political level that echoes that German fear that we were all growing up with. And then the, the, the level of the loss of nature in, in the uh, species loss and then this pandemic. So it's, it's the same kind of peculiar uh, melding of our neuroses that we, we've been making this work about for so many years seems to all be kind of coming together in this moment. A certain cycle that you see through history of, um, of people getting uh, comfortable and complacent and then inevitably uh, events conspire to, to kind of uh, you know, make that kind of that easy life and world disintegrate, and then you have to, uh, you know, society has to regenerate itself. Yeah. So, is this one of the reasons that you decided to make your uh, troop a German troop as well? To kind Precisely. of. Precisely. Yeah. Out of, we were looking a lot at um, a German cabaret of the 20s. Um, because we also had a previous project um, called Iceberg Freistadt, um, which was sort of about, it was about global warming in a more overt way. The idea was we invented a fictional iceberg that ran aground in the German town of Lübeck in the uh, 1920s. And um, during that time period, uh, the great inflation happened in Germany. And in the kind of upheaval in society, there was a lot of amazing avant-garde art, um, a lot of amazing performances and cabaret troops. So we were thinking about all that as kind of the aesthetic that we'd use for the project uh, that you guys have up in the gallery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also what you said earlier, Richard, I find it um, very interesting and powerful that um, I've read it too that our like our current generation has forgotten uh, because of vaccinations has forgotten the fear of living with a pandemic because the generations before us before vaccinations they they constantly live with that fear and some parts of the world they still deal with polio and stuff but we're we're no longer we don't have that fear anymore so for us yeah, yeah we've, we've I think me and Nicholas, by nature, I think are warriors. Yeah. And so the uh, artwork is about us trying to work through our anxieties, whether it's about financial collapse or pandemics or, or global warming, whatever it is. We try and work through those fears and anxieties in the artwork. But we also try to make something truly beautiful and alluring uh, a lot of bright color, as you can see in the current things. We've used flowers when we're dealing with uh, the drowning world as a way to uh, connect it with some Dutch still lives and, and the, the, the beauty of art and culture and poetry and, and film. And so there's so much we love in the world, but there's so much we fear about what's going on. So we try to celebrate the beauty of the world at the same time as alerting people to something's really wrong and we have to pay attention. I think also as, as artists, we have great uh, kind of uh, sympathy and interest in other artists, the, the, you know, through the ages who've kind of uh, been through these things and uh, attempted to chronicle them in one way or another. Um, so, you know, we look at a lot of art history and play off a lot of that in our work. Yeah, which we'll also um, next week, Thursday, have a closer look into with Mara Coughlin. So uh, tune in for that. I want to get back to some of the questions uh, yeah. mm -hmm. because we're getting quite a bit of people uh, asking question, questions. So this one's from Catherine. What does uh, Troop Fledermaus feel are the magical properties of these flags and or the meaning behind that? Okay, Nicholas. Well, I, 
I wanted to play off of, I, I've, I've spent some time in Nepal uh, where they have Tibetan prayer flags, which are activated by the wind, sends the, the prayer out there. So it's, there's some kind of talismanic magic and it's often when, with phrases um, somewhat encoded. I've looked at a lot of uh, like Roman and Greek talismans and med medieval magic and the kinds of prayers and sort of analyze the way that they often work and trying to come up with uh, a similar style of encoding the meaning just enough, but being, it, being able to, to read it if you really look at all the clues. And that, that and something in the kind of emblematic quality of an image that sort of you can seal in your mind and imagine. Um, and there's that which will let loose those prayers onto nature. And I'm trying to imagine that the the animals are picking up on that intent uh that you're if you're going out there and talking to the insects and willing them to metamorphose and help them to get back and say say to them there's a connection that they that we're not all trying to get rid of them that some of us are connecting together to make a world where they're being brought back and and we're the rewilding quality in what i'm trying to uh, put into these flags is is about bringing nature back to what it once was uh, yeah letting the land go wild again yeah we have personal um interest in history with the concept of uh, rewilding because uh, a lot of our career we spent on uh, cape cod which which is basically it's a post-apocalyptic landscape that's been rewilded because um obviously when uh, the um uh, Europeans first arrived there, um, the landscape was in a pretty natural condition. Um, and they got a few good years of farming out of it, but then it basically turned into a dust bowl and was kind of re reduced to shifting sand dunes blowing all over the place. And then since um, since it's reverted to, to being now a lot of it's uh, uh, the national seashore, um, and We've actually seen in the time that we've been there, uh, the forests regenerate. We've seen animals return. Uh, fish have come back. And then because the fish came back, seals came back. Because the seals came back, now there's sharks all over the place. Uh, coyotes came over the bridge. Even a bear came over the bridge. Uh, so we've kind of like, we've actually spent time in a landscape that's essentially rewilding in, in front of our eyes. So uh, that's part of kind of the, the genesis of watching that happen and thinking about it and how that can happen in other places, other landscapes that have been abandoned. And what we're finding now, obviously with um, the pandemic is much is coming back all over the world because we're stopping doing so many things and we're not interfering as much and how quickly the nature is regenerating if you just give it a chance so there's some some hope here there's actually a really great book on that which is called the world without us and the premises that uh, yeah. yeah you know what yeah I, it's great it's a great book everybody uh, check it out um we have another question from stephanie uh what are your thoughts on this remote residency oh. experience oh that's another great book sorry richard can you show it us again yeah. let's hold it up there it is yeah she's an uh, she's an english uh, author who took a big big piece of land uh, that she lives on and has let it totally go back and all the species that are, are super rare all coming back to her 500 acres just by letting it go wild again. Super inspirational for this. Yes, definitely. Um, I'll I have to go check that out. Uh, you'll have to type the name out for yeah. me later. <laughs> um, what are the thoughts on this remote residency experience so far in comparison to typical residencies that you've been part of in the past? Yeah, I'd say this is uh, absolutely nothing whatever like any residency we've done in the past. Because uh, typically our residencies, when we've uh, done them before, um, we get everyone in, in the community uh, around the residency involved. Um, we typically bring a lot of outfits. Anyone who wants to participate can come and we'll kind of uh, 
all dress up in costumes and uh, go do larger uh, group scenes in the in the photography part. Uh, so that's all stuff that we were thinking of trying to do towards the end of this residency. Uh, so yeah, the virtual residency is is a strange experience. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, I'm imagining my, because I've never worked in this room before as an art studio, so I'm virtually imagining this is, I'm out in California in this beautiful white studio that I thought I'd have, so I created a, a simulacrum of, of, a, of a, a different studio to start a different headset. So I am starting a new series, which is often what I might do in a residency, so to that extent it relates, and I'm having these kind of daily encounters with a group of interesting people in a different place, but they're not in person. So it's interesting. And I'm often inspired by the landscape in a different place, which is one of the reasons I love residencies. That's getting a little hard. I would have loved to have been wandering on the, on the land and finding the different plant, plants all around you there in uh, the San Diego Hills. But next Normally time. a residency, the, uh, wherever the, the place is, and we've, we've done them all over the place. Uh, we get inspired by whatever the local landscape is. Uh, so it's also strange not having that element. Uh, for me personally, I'm like uh, Nicholas. I can't really, uh, I can't go to my studio currently and I don't really have one in the house. Uh, so it's even less of, a, of an art experience that I have than I have in my normal real life let alone being as a, a residency, so it's weird. Or maybe you're having an Eve's Klein experience and art as absent. It's all, in, it's all in here. My virtual residency, Nicholas has his room, mine's in here. <laughs> 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 well, um, it's actually really interesting because I don't even recognize the landscape here in San Diego now because we've had, had so much rain in the past couple of weeks that everything is green and wow. it's beautiful, but it, it's wilding. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Send us some pictures of what we missed. I, I, I really love to see what it looks like on the Lux grounds if you're ever able to go there with, without the Gestapo stop, stopping you. Yeah, I'll uh, share a picture that I took yesterday uh, because we had a uh, flood warning everywhere. Our bio swell that's usually empty overflowed. So, <laughs> yes, I'd love to see. see. <laughs> Um, so the next question, oh, actually, this is a shout out from Lisa Khan. She just wanted to say hi. She's a fellow graduate from Washington University School of Fine Arts. Uh, <laughs> very cool. Hi. Yeah, we, we loved our time at WashU. It was, it was very formative for us, um, though St. Louis itself wasn't necessarily the, the, the heart of what was great about it, but the, the facilities there were amazing and mixing all the different uh, stuff that we got at the library at the university were, was very influential on both of us. The mix of ideas from the comparative literature department and what we got in the art school was, was really helpful for the conception of a lot of the projects that we're still working on now, go back to ideas that Rich and I got through at WashU. Uh, I have another question here from uh, Sean. Uh, he or Nicholas, you said your grandfather was a cameraman. Did he work in a traditional photography or was he a cinematographer? I ask because I'm fascinated with Weimar era cinema. Ah, well, my grandfather, my father's father worked in, in Hollywood as a sort of head of the department for Fox of costumes and props uh, for uh, 20th Century Fox from the mid thirties to the sixties. So he was in there working on all these movies, building worlds but not an actual craftsperson, but more heads of these various departments deciding a lot, telling who, where people were supposed to be on, this, on the set, on the night shift during the war years. My father was a cameraman with 16 millimeter film in World War II in Europe during the war uh, in, in London and then the invasion in Normandy and through France and into Germany and uh, also Belgium. And so I grew up with a lot of his footage that he shot in those years. Then he was uh, kind of head of the news desk at uh, Movito Newsreels and uh, deciding who was going out and what stories, but he wasn't shooting at that point. He what wished he was shooting. So and then this, in the 1960s, um, he got back into the photo union and he was shooting with film for the, the local news in New York 
and I used to, growing up in the 70s, go out with him on stories, be his uh, chief schlepper, and we'd uh, see murders in New York, and he'd meet celebrities, and he'd come home every night and tell me stories of what happened, and eventually it moved into uh, uh, video, uh, and uh, what, more closer to what we know now uh, through the course of his career. And he's still kicking at 96, I just saw him today. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's I can imagine the life that he must have had, you know, filming all of that. But is that available anywhere to see or? Uh, there's stuff in the National Archives that he shot that I've seen, but they, we don't have anything up. He, there's a really good interview with him that's somewhere online uh, that tells some of his story, Jerry Kahn. Um, and then my grandfather's story, there's nothing out there particularly, but I, I, I know little bits of it here and there. So. I, I asked my dad, and he remembers more of that stuff than he does about what happened this week. Um, so he tells me tons of stories. And the storytelling aspect and being the first person uh, watching and meeting all these famous people and seeing history happen, I think that all affected me in, in the creation of a lot of the stories that we, we do in some ways are built around crisis and, and, and uh, history. He's deeply interested in history and having lived a lot of it and reads a lot in it and same with Richard and myself, we just sort of like to insert ourselves into history in a strange way. Yeah, I, I uh, definitely feel that as well. Growing up, I would hear a lot of stories of my uh, grandfather and his time during the, uh, during the Second World War and how him and his brother experienced it and a big family and hearing those stories, I always feel really connected to storytelling as well and like those family histories and definitely, yeah. I think uh, a lot of uh, people all over the world have very strong ties still to this day to that history. And now they're developing a new series of stories around what they're doing during the COVID pandemic. So the, this is a time where um, the ideas and stories behind what will be epic films and strange novels and other new forms of art will happen. Um, so this is a really interesting time everyone should be recording in whatever their art form they can, their experiences of how they're going through these conflicts that we're all having. This is, it's a rich time and that's why I'm working harder than ever to kind of capture these moments in these flags, in the stories that we're gonna try and photograph and, and, and in the writings and videos we might do. So uh, I'm more working hard now than I even thought I was working hard before. Yeah. Um, that's actually leads into a really interesting question that just came in. Uh, how do you think uh, the troop is dealing with the social distancing measure? Uh, what uh, ways might de their journey, journeys and performances change to match our changing world? Yeah, I would say um, I actually, funnily enough, um, once I went into quarantine, I actually uh, reread our book and uh, looked at all the images in it and it felt so much of uh, so much the flavor of what's going on at the moment that I actually almost feel like in a weird way the troupe has already kind of been through this weird reality of um, of the world being slightly deserted uh, no one quite knowing what's really going on um people being ill uh so it, it's in my mind it's almost a funny kind of a disconnect because i feel like uh at least in our imaginary kind of lives that uh, to do with our artwork i almost feel like we've kind of like imagined our way through all this a little bit so it's really hard for me to try and contemplate um how it, it might affect whatever the future adventures of the true part yeah it's it's odd also the quality of everyone in their little mini theaters in their worlds where they're living are kind of recreating poses from uh old paintings and artwork and a lot of our uh photographs in nature with no audience are us in strange costumes recreating in some strange version a Bruegel painting or all these different subtle art, art historical references, but we're doing it in nature rather than these closed in rooms that everyone's doing now. But we saw nature as the theater, but zero audience, just the, 
the animals watching them and then to see these everyone making these theatrical scenes with just their little computer and cameras as, as the audience is just eerie for me now. So yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, I am kind of looking towards a future past this with this new work at the same time as trying to be here and now. I think that's right. I think, uh, I think me and Nicholas are almost trying to kind of like think about, yeah, think, think about whatever's uh, next maybe. Um, we're not quite sure what that is, and that's part of our kind of, kind of ongoing conversations, which definitely all this um, makes more difficult because me and Nicholas are used to actually kind of uh, during this phase of a project um, meeting directly a lot um, and looking at things together. Um, and obviously, the current conditions have made that uh, uh, difficult. So it's definitely it's kind of curtailing the development of the project in that way, I'd say. Great, so I wanna ask one more question uh, just to round it up, but then uh, for those of you whose question I didn't get to, uh, Nicholas and Richard will be joining us next week, Saturday for a live reading from their book. Um, so there will be another opportunity to ask questions and then the following week on um, Saturday, we'll have another uh, update on the studio visit. So come back, ask your questions if I didn't get a chance to ask them this time. Um, so the last question for you guys, can you speak a bit more on how your Eisenberg Freestadt series may have hinted at or reflected the 2008 recession and the political econ economic climate at the time? Yeah, I think, um... Yeah, I, uh, the project was uh, Iceberg Freistadt, which uh, in, in our kind of like, um, you know, Google Translate German uh, means an Iceberg Free State. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely noticed that there was kind of like a lot of uh, exuberance going on around uh, real estate and, and things felt a little bubbly and weird and alarming. Um, and so we started kind of dealing with some of those worries and with and also with global warming because it was equally about that so we started uh thinking about some of those things and kind of um uh dealing with them in that project um during that time period like uh, money was so worthless that uh blank paper was actually worth more than money uh, because blank paper you could actually uh, use for more things than you could use for money. Yeah, uh, I, I got just collecting um, Notgeld, which is these emergency banknotes that every little municipality issued. And you can imagine that going on now, where the world is getting to smaller and smaller. It used to be super interconnected. You could fly anywhere in a second. And so I this just, I just to explain Notgeld uh, quickly. It was like it kind of came out of uh, the metal shortage in uh, in World War One. Uh, so in other words, there was so little metal in Germany that uh, municipalities issued their own uh, paper money to use as a uh, small change. And then eventually, like the municipalities that kept doing that, once the high inflation hit, they had to, uh, you know, just keep making these ridiculously high value banknotes over and over. Nicholas. And then, and then I had grown up with some of this stuff my dad had gathered and told me about finding rooms wallpapered in World War II in Germany with this strange banknotes with the billion mark notes with a million zeros at the end of them. And it was always magical to me seeing those notes and wondering what a society would be like in hyperinflation as a little kid. And so I started uh, seeing beautiful artwork on these banknotes when I started collecting them. They were, they're not expensive and they have fantastic different designs for each city state. And then that sort of stamp and coin collector in me went crazy with that. And then so I started drawing icebergs on the banknotes and creating a whole world, mixing the story of climate change with the economic collapse um, and seeing if I could uh, somehow digest what would it be like to have an economic collapse and a uh, a collapse of the ecosystem and the global melting of icebergs and how would you deal with that? Out the kind of the world turning completely upside down because uh, hyperinflation can kind of, kind of defy one's ability to even conceptualize it. Like in the worst case of hyperinflation in uh, Hungary, all the the entire uh, 
the entire currency, all the banknotes produced in Hungary, were worth less than the U.S. cent. Uh, so it, it's it's a thing that's kind of absurd, and it's the world upside down, uh, much in the way that kind of like, you know, when we we were thinking about global warming, that you also think about cities potentially going underwater. It's kind of a complete overturning of the world as you know it. So yeah, everything that we're going through now is something, these kinds of upside down rules in the world that we're all experiencing, everything is opposite of what you're used to, is, is sort of the way that Rich and I make our art is like trying on these flavors of, of absurdity and trying to imagine what it'd be like and having empathy for the people in those times, but kind of pulling ourselves into a kind of theater around those events and making something slightly surreal that you couldn't quite believe, but so connected to history. If you look it up, it all happened and blurring the boundaries between them. And that's sort of what, what been our method for many, many of our projects. Uh, well, guys, thank you so much. It's been really amazing learning more from you to hear more about what your product projects are like, your inspirations. And I look forward to hearing much more in our next uh, episodes coming up, uh, starting on Thursday with the In Conversation with Mar Mar uh, Mara Coughlin uh, about the art historical references that you use, and then on Saturday, um, the reading from your book, which is, I have it here, which is amazing. Uh, so it will be a great experience for everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone. Uh, all right, guys, have a wonderful rest of your weekend, everybody at home as well, and we'll see you next week.